The threat of vote buying heightened, one among many other issues facing the 2019 elections. Vote buying has always been there. It's only that recently it is becoming more brazen. We have seen two major cases of vote buying in the equity governorship election and at the PDP National uh, Convention. These are two instances of brazen vote uh, buying. But for me, it is not really a problem to our electoral uh, politics. Number one is that there is a limit to how many people a candidate or a party can buy. For instance, we are going for the general elections, including the presidential elections, which is across the whole nation. How many people can a presidential candidate buy? I, I, I don't know if you are getting it. Let us say that the person who will win will win with maybe 15, 20 million votes. And you make a budget for buying 20 million people. So it is something that has come up at the stage of our electoral development. And I feel that it is something that eventually will uh, outgrow. Uh, you know, if we keep talking about it so much, we'll be bringing legitimacy crisis to our elections. But I, I don't think it, it has that potential of, uh, of uh, destroying our electoral uh, politics. It is something that has come up, and it is something that will eventually uh, fizzle out. You know, as we keep having elections, as we keep having candidates that we can easily decide between. Once we have candidates that are clearly apart, the, the issue of vote buying will not come there. Most times it comes when the candidates are similar, when the candidates are running neck to neck, and it is that extra money that will now make the difference. But in situations where candidates are posed apart, in situations where parties are posed apart, I mean, there is a limit to how many votes you can buy, and which means that over time, these things will disappear. At a forum with representatives of political parties, the INEC chairman talks tough against vote buying. We are right now working with the security agencies. We shall arrest, we shall prosecute, and make public show of how not to behave in a democracy. We will make a big statement on vote buying issues. And when the time comes, don't say you are not forewarned. You are forewarned. Whoever is involved, we are going to make a very powerful statement. We can carry this menace into the 2019 general election. Changing the mindset of the people therefore becomes imperative, as the choices made at the 2019 election would no doubt remain with them for another four years. Apparently clear it is that there is no ideological trace to any of the major political parties or the minor political parties that we have in Nigeria. Whether that is a plus or minus can be debated. But once you don't have ideology, you cannot tell Nigerians to look out for anything. Again, let's go back to the United States. That's the closest example that we have is the most open of all the democracies that we can read about and talk about. And it's a senior when it comes to the practice of democracy. You will always know that whoever becomes president in the United States under um, the conservative party will always pursue a particular agenda. Gun sale must not stop, aggression towards war, um, very low if not zero tolerance for absolutely free and happy-go-lucky activities such as abortion, such as gay practices and all this. The ideas are there. So whoever becomes the president, we just key into that. Idea. He's not going to say he wants to go the Democrat way, okay? And then the Democrats too will always come out in the same position. That's what we're talking about. But here, okay, the parties don't have, this is our tradition, this is what we always do. So even if a fool becomes our presidential bearer, flag bearer tomorrow, he will still key into this structure. We don't have that in Nigeria. However, it could be our own style of democracy, because I don't believe every democracy must flow the American way. 
if we accept it as our own style of democracy, the questions will no longer be what will Nigerians get out of it, okay? The questions will be how will Nigerians be able to identify those who will serve their purpose. Then I will say the only way is to look at their pedigree. You is to resize the person. Who is this man? Who is this man in terms of his democratic capability? Is he a dictator? Is he a dictator? Is he corrupt? If he's not corrupt, does he hate corruption? Because sometimes some people may be seen as not being corrupt, but corrupt people are all around them and they tolerate them and protect them. They are two different things. That's what Nigerians should know. So Nigerians should do very critical analysis on this second model that we are building. Are we looking for a corrupt leader? Is not being corrupt alone capable of building a nation's economy. I mean, I even, I mean, often, quite often give an analogy to the people. If you run a university system and the university is not doing what it's supposed to do, two basic functions of the university are learning and research, teaching and research. If you have a university that is not functioning in this area, and then you identify that, okay, for us to be able to manage this university, let us bring a pastor who is holy, doesn't commit sin, doesn't fornicate, doesn't drink, is not corrupt, to be the head of the university. That university will not only somersault, but collapse. Because that is not what it needs to build a university. You need somebody who is focused in research and learning. Even if he's corrupt, the system will check the person. I think these are the factors Nigerians must begin to look at. Beyond the person, you must ask certain critical questions. It is not enough to say, this man is this, this man is that, and based on that, you hand over a nation to the man. It may somehow sort. I don't want to be partisan, and you can see I'm very careful. And that's why I'm doing this analysis. A cross-section of electorates on the street make their demands before the 2019 election. You please help us eradicate poverty. The level of poverty in this country is high. So economically, it needs to create more jobs. Many of us are graduates. There's no job. There's nothing. So we need a president who will help us economically, grow the economy of the country, create more jobs opportunity for the youth. Um, I would like a president that will see to the affairs of the citizens making life pleasurable and easier for the citizens of Nigeria. So we are praying to God to lead us in choosing the right person. Everything needs attention in Nigeria. Talking about education, health, anything. There are a lot of youth in the country without employment. The people that are well read, they are all over the places without any job. So everything should be addressed. Everything about Nigeria needs being addressed. I want a president who will move the, who will continue to move the nation forward, that every citizen will enjoy, socially, politically, and that everything that God has endured, uh, endured to, to us. Uh, we have so many, as, as, at the moment, we have so many problems, but the mo the what he can tackle, what I want the, the, the next president to tackle is about the employment. Employment. But because there are so many people who are unemployed as at today, the youth. And uh, I would suggest that uh, they, they should consider, the, the next president should consider retiring those old people, at least, uh, downgrade the, the level of uh, years of service. So that the youth will move up because there are so many youth unemployed in the country.